One Detroit is at the Grand Hotel for the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference. Coming up, I go one-on-one -on -one with Governor Gretchen Whitmer, plus the headlines from the parlor. Also, hear from Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and the culmination of Nolan and Stevens' civility project. I'm Christy McDonald. It's all coming up on One Detroit. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Support is also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, Business Leaders for Michigan, ITC Holdings, LLC, Michigan Technological University, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi and welcome to One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. We are at the Grand Hotel for the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference. It's the second day of the conference and the conversation is focused on business development, education and leadership. Coming up, I go one-on-one -on -one with Governor Gretchen Whitmer after her keynote address at the conference. Plus, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan talks about city improvements over the past year and what's next. Also, Nolan and Stephen wrap up their civility project with the Detroit Regional Chamber. And then the guys from Under the Radar Michigan go in search of butterflies here on the island. That's your moment of zen. It's all coming up. But let's start with the governor. She signed the auto insurance reform bill into law this morning. The bipartisan agreement will lower auto insurance rates in the state. The governor was joined by Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, Mayor Mike Duggan, and Democratic and Republican legislators. Governor Whitmer was also a keynote speaker at the conference, and I had a one-on-one -on -one interview with her following her address. What are the conversations you're having now with leadership in the legislature about your 45 cent tax? Well, I think it's no surprise to anyone that during all of our conversations, I, I raised the roads. And we've talked about um, that we do need to make a great investment in our roads. The, um, there's not... I've, there's not been an alternative that's been suggested at this juncture. And I think it's because of what I just explained. There are no easy solutions to this. And while there's been some discussion in Lansing, maybe there are savings to be had, um, I think it's time for us to be honest about what it's going to take. And to pretend that after eight years of, you know, the, the last administration and the last group of legislators that there could be any further savings in government to solve this problem is, is not, it's not real. And that's why um, I think there's going to be earnest conversations that get started as we leave the island and with this momentum and goodwill that's been built up on the last tough issue that we tackled. Mm -hmm. But we, we need to get serious about whether it's a gas tax or if someone has a different idea that actually fixes the problem. I've said I'm, I'm eager to have that You're totally open to that, to hearing that. You know, it's interesting, though, when you talk to people about the 45-cent gas tax, there is this larger philosophical conversation they have about trust in government, that if they give you that money, are you going to be doing the right things? Are you going to be fixing the roads in the right way? And how can we kind of change that conversation, or how can you tell people, Yes, trust us, when I think people have really built up a, a distrust of what they're doing in government. Well, I tell people all the time, I agree. I, I'm frustrated as well. You saw the 2018 gas tax and how it didn't change the trajectory, just slowed our decline. We were sold a bill of goods and um, told that it actually fixed the problem when everyone knew that it really didn't. Uh, I think it's much better to take a hard vote that fixes a problem than to take a hard vote that actually just mitigates the, the damage that's being done. And that's why I said, if I'm gonna lead with a tax to fix this, it's gotta be big enough to actually fix the problem. Because I don't wanna ask the legislature to take a hard vote and have this conversation again in three years and lose trust, further erode trust in government. The gas tax actually ensures every penny goes to the roads because of the constitutional protections. 
And so a future legislature, a future governor can't redirect those dollars. People will see their money at work. And we know that there's an appetite to make investments because we see bonds at the local level pass all the time. Right. But they don't trust the state, and that's why it's important for us to do it this way, I think. You know, we talked a lot about relationships up here and how that's how you can get things done by making sure that you start having relationships with people and you build that trust. How would you characterize your relationship with the leadership in the legislature right now? I think we've got a good relationship. It's been um, certainly, you know, getting to know one another. I've been, I've met with the quadrant every other week since the first of the year. Uh, that's not happened in at least three governors, um, and I think that that was something that's really important. Sometimes our meetings, they're just a half an hour, and they're, they're not very substantive, but sometimes we get right into issues, but we're getting to know each other and build trust that way. All right, so look who I found in the parlor, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, and Stephen <laughs> Henderson of WDET, milling around. and American Black Journal. Yeah, you guys are always milling around, talking to everybody, and you know, coming out of listening to what the governor had to say um, this afternoon, Nolan, you talked to leadership in the legislature, so can you give us an idea of now how close we're getting it, since we already got no fault done, now I think we're getting a little greedy. We want to see what was going to happen with the roads and, and where they are in that kind of negotiation. Well, they're not close in terms of the idea they're stating publicly. Lee Chatfield was on my radio show this morning. Uh, Lee said that, you know, he thinks the money's in the budget, you know, to, to fix the roads. He, like his contention two, two, is- Two billion? What he says is they've already passed since 2015, 1.2 billion. So they only need 800 million more. And he said, you look at the surplus last year, that would just about cover it. Mike Shirky doesn't think that's where the money's gonna come from. So even the Republicans aren't in sync. Governor still wants the 2.5 billion from a, a gas hike. I don't think they're anywhere near close on that. But you know, at one point they weren't close on auto insurance reform. They're having and they already. signed a bill out here today, which was really historic, Stephen. Yeah. No, first significant auto reform uh, legislation since 1973. Uh, this is for any governor. This would be a big deal. For a governor who's only been in office uh, five months now, it's a huge, huge deal. And what she's got to do is she's got to build on that momentum uh, and, and twist some arms. I mean, at the end of the day, there's not a way to, to make significant advances on the roads without new revenue. Uh, Republicans want to keep pretending some uh, that that's not necessary. Uh, but they're wrong, and they're, they're just dead wrong. And she's got to use, I think, uh, the goodwill that she gets from uh, this auto insurance uh, legislation to, to leverage against the people who are in the way. How does signing that, though, set up expectations for her now in the future, especially with the business community here at this, well, I think at this event? I, I'm not sure it sets up expectation. I think it relieves a lot of fears that this group wouldn't be able to work together. And so they come in saying the right things about bipartisanship and consistent building, working together. They proved it on that bill. Uh, whether they can do it on the road bill or not, again, she hasn't really made her case to the Michigan people for this. You're asking lawmakers, many of whom are going to face an unexpected election in 2020, or maybe, uh, to take a very unpopular vote because there is not the public support for a, for a gas hike that that large or perhaps of any size. But, if you, well, if you but I think, but I think, hang on, I think there's a huge discrepancy between whether $1.2 billion is needed to fix the roads or $2.5 billion. No to one fix the really roads. thinks it's $1.2 billion. He's not right about that number. That money uh, went into the budget, but because we didn't fully fund it at that point, we've fallen behind, further behind on maintenance, and the roads have and deteriorated more. And they're still waiting more. for that second 600 there is not, million. There is not uh, a question about the 2.5. We do need that number. Uh, Nolan's right, though, that, that this is a case she now has to make to the people, because the polling on that 45 cent gas tax is terrible. But if you talk to the governor's people about how they have been hearing from people about it. They've been going around the state talking to, to, to different groups right. about it. Of course, when they open up, people are very much against that gas tax hike. But when they make the case about why they need it, what they'll do with it, and the lack of other alternatives, they say they end up with most of the people in the room on their side. They shouldn't have to do that on a statewide basis, though, because 
uh, the numbers are so bad in the poll. Well, that's what Paul Agdaba, who is the head of MDOT, is going around, and he's part of that. And But he's also hearing from people that they don't trust that the government will, will do, do with the money that's that what they're supposed problem. to do. And that's really hard to get through. In the minds of the Michigan people, the money is there to fix the roads. We're just using it in the wrong way. That's what lawmakers are hearing, and that's why they're feeding into this. I remember when Rick Snyder went around the state with chunks of concrete, put a huge public service campaign out to get a 15 cent tax hike. Right. And, and lost. couldn't do it, and lost. Right. I, I think this is a tough sell, uh, and asking politicians who are gonna face the voters soon to do it, that's a tough sell. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. He took the stage, and he's usually a really anticipated speaker. Um, he, you know, touched on all the points, and, and he made the, you know, disparaging comment, kind of poking at the media, is that they say they talk about downtown, and then the neighborhoods. Well, there's a lot of people in the neighborhoods that would take, you know, it's not just the neighborhoods. There's a lot of different places well, where a lot of stuff is and, being done. You know, he's gotten to the point where it's almost ridiculous. He won't even talk about downtown. We interviewed him yesterday. I asked him about the Illiches, for example. He said, oh, that's not my priority. I'm not worried about downtown. I'm worried about Grand River and Gratiot. You know, he is so paranoid now of even saying the word downtown that it's almost silly. Yeah, but he said that he is going to be staying in this role for as long as the voters would, would have him, at least. Yeah. That's what you got out of him yeah. anyway. I huh? thought, I thought uh, that was interesting, right? Because yeah. uh, I think he's at the, he's at the most... Uh, uh, difficult maybe passage in, in the time that he's been in office when he's got problems that he can't control. And that is the thing that drives Mike Duggan the craziest, the things that he he can't get his arms around and say, I know how to solve this. Uh, and I think th there's fair speculation that uh, this may be the, the thing that, that makes him decide not to run again in 2021, even though he's standing up here today. I don't think he had it. There's nothing else he could say today. Well, I mean, he was pretty, he seemed pretty clear to me. He said, I'm putting out five, six year plans. He could have simply say, I'll make, I'm the, not gonna I'll make my decision when the time comes. Okay. But he added, you know, I'm putting out five, six year plans. If the voters decide to rehire me, I'll be there. And he said he's got no interest in going to Washington. He this also is his said, last job. He also yeah. said to us when he moved into the city, yeah. I'm not running for mayor. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to see. Well, he did uh, kind of give an annual progress report on the city, including updates on city services, housing, demolition, rehab, and jobs. Take a look. Well, let's talk about uh, what we did. We had to deal with the services, and so we went to work. A lot of this stuff seemed boring, but we put crews out to fix water main break, which was really important uh, if you lived in one of the neighborhoods. We got the buses on the road, added 2,000 trips a week. We turned on 65,000 streetlights in less than three years. And with my partners on Detroit City Council, and we have an outstanding city council in the city of Detroit. We went from years of deficits to four straight balanced budgets, and on June 30th, it'll be our fifth straight balanced budget in the city of Detroit. And the thing is that council, I'm not having a fight with council to balance the budget. They are just as committed as I am, because when you are delivering this and you're not worrying about laying people off or cutting their benefits, you can actually focus on how do you rebuild the city. And so that's what we've been doing. So we dealt with the services. We had to deal with the physical appearance of the city. If you drove into the city in 2014, you saw graffiti covering buildings. You saw piles of trash everywhere. You saw abandoned houses. The New York Times featured, this was the image nationally of the city of Detroit. If we didn't address the physical appearance, there's no point in trying to recruit folks. And so uh, we came at this and said, we're going to deal with this blight issue, 40,000 houses. The city had historically been taking down about 1,000 houses a year. At that rate, it would have taken us about 40 years. But we assessed all of the contractor capacity. If we got every contractor to max out, they could still only do three or 4,000 a year. Even at that pace, it's going to be 10 to 12 years. Think about the conversation I had to have with the people of the city of Detroit. That if our best case scenario, if we went four times faster than any city in America in demolition, it's still going to be 10 or 12 years. And the only way to handle this is through honest conversation. Uh, and they weren't easy. But we started by saying, let's prove we can do demolition on a large scale. And we picked five neighborhoods in the city that were some of our strongest neighborhoods. And we worked some of the bugs out. We got in and we got moving. And then we said, OK, let's expand to the next area. We had federal funding that allowed us to do this. And the feds required us to go into fine zones. And so I said, let's do it objectively. Let's pull out our data and take every a neighborhood in the city that's 90% or more occupied, and let's demolish there.
You know, for the past couple of months, we've been talking about Nolan and Stevens' uh, Detroit Civility Project, which you launched in partnership with the Detroit Regional Chamber. And the project matches people up from different backgrounds for a one-on-one -on -one conversation to learn more about each other. It's been really, really interesting to see, and it's been on the agenda here on the island. That term civility, much talked about these days, but how to put it into practice? At the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference, sort of sessions word, led by our own uh, Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley try to point the way. The sort of key word for this project is the ability to sit and listen to somebody else, listen to someone else's story, and listen uh, in a way that really respects what they're saying as opposed to anticipating what you might say in response, something that's really hard to do. This is the culmination of the Chamber's Detroit Civility Project, pairing 80 people from differing perspectives to join together and talk, just like Stephen and Nolan, a liberal and a conservative, drinking buddies who partake in bourbon, preferably crafted in Kentucky, really their friends although it might not always sound that way. They were never threatening anyone else. So right. it, it made me, and hang on, hang on one second, hang on one second. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm the first person to say, this is not easy. It is not easy to do uh, with Nolan. No, uh, it is not easy to do with other people uh, with whom I disagree. It has become less easy in the last few years. And welcome to the special edition of Hannity. The cable channels, on the radio and online, the social media, and those faces, those voices, they can be triggering. No collusion, no obstruction, no nothing. We get everything from rudeness in the workplace to potential assault to people having violent outbursts. Businesses hire Detroit attorney Terry Bonnett to fight incivility in the workplace. We have a, a history of case law in, in Michigan that says, you know, that the workplace is never intended to be an idyllic retreat. But at the same time, we also have a generation of um, employees who were raised in which the most important thing that you could do was to reinforce their self-esteem. They've never been told, hey, it, it's my way. You've got to do it this way. And so when, when you mix that increased sensitivity to conflict with more of a political environment in which there's additional conflict, it, it creates a bad situation. We're searching for civility in the time of polarization. And then there's the politics of identity and race. You know, for a long time, there were no new people coming to Detroit. Lauren Hood leads conversations like this one called the Better Arguments Project, where longtime Detroiters come together with new arrivals. When I'm facilitating conversations on race, I always put myself like in the journey also. Like even though I'm a black person and I'm a person who's moderated hundreds of people in these conversations, I still know that I have work to do. You know what's happening down here in Detroit. Some of the conversations fostered by the Detroit Civility Project have touched on, well, some touchy issues. Here, Tamuk Scruggs and Madonna Van Fossen get together. Van Fossen lives in northern Oakland County, Omsbud's person for smart transit system bus riders. Decades out of high school, in Detroit, Scruggs is a community activist and says he's finally found a real career as a sheet metal worker. I get that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, uh, if, if Detroiters wanted better jobs, they should get up, go to school, get a better education, go to college. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's really difficult to do that when you have a school system that's been bankrupt and just people just trying to survive. So. Right. Our, our stories are so different, but they're so similar because of the struggles that we've overcome. My story includes things like divorce, uh, bankruptcy, foreclosure, death, suicides. I was able to, not by myself, but with, you know, God, I'm not going to lie, God's a big part of my life, and support groups and learning how to reach out and ask for help or learning how to become part. So when I met you, I got that vibe right away. You got to care about a person who's impacted by this stuff before you'll you'll start to shift your consciousness around it. Hood says these kinds of conversations can be tough if the participants can't create relationships. When they do, in the encounters she's led, she's seen real breakthroughs. There was a white guy in the room who said, "Like my dad and my uncle are cops. I don't understand this." poor relationship that black men have with policemen and there were like four other wh black men in the group who each had you know a story a, a personal story and after that like he understood you could see that in that moment he had his aha moment he knew them as people first and then heard their stories and was like oh I live in Detroit 
it's bad here every day, but we're getting better. Scruggs and Van Fossen have met the basic requirements as participants of the Detroit Civility Project, and now they have a relationship that probably wouldn't have happened any other way. It was kind of a bonding situation for us because I've gone through a lot of transitions myself, having multiple felonies. Just growing up in a community where the majority of individuals come from divorced and broken homes, so having to overcome those situations uh, takes a bit of strength. And she has gone through her own set of circumstances and she exhibited that same kind of strength. The chances that I would come down to Detroit and meet someone like Tomok on my own are kind of slim. It's just not probably something that would happen. But because of my job and I get to do things like this, and now I've met him. And as a result, I've been able to connect him with a few things that could help his movements you know, through my job. He's going to help me out and come speak at a couple different groups that I participate in. We always say, look, this is something we're, we're, we're not going to be able to, to settle. This is something we're not going to be able to agree on. But we will keep working at it, and we will also leave intact the rest of the relationship, right? We want people to at least respect each other. There's been so much over the last couple of years, this notion that we can't talk to each other, and I believe we can talk to each other. I believe we can respect each other. I, can believe, I believe we can learn from each other, even if we never come to agreement. All right, so the big question on civility is, how do we keep it going from here and how do you kind of transfer a lot of the feelings or kind of some of the feel good, let's work together that we've kind of come up to here back home? Well, the people who participated in the Civility Project over the last few months that the Chamber uh, put, put on are uh, very enthused about it. And we're, we had very good feedback during the se session yesterday. We have another session coming up today. Uh, good feedback and hopefully they'll take this back into their communities, back into the organization and other people will try to try to do this. I mean, I was really impressed with some of the comments we, we got. Yeah, yeah and people. how people took it very, very seriously. They, yeah. they really did, and they got to spaces that uh, I would have thought it would have taken them longer to together, right? It takes years sometimes, as uh, the, uh, the two of us have proved, to, to, to really get to that space. But they really had, uh, had experienced uh, exactly what we wanted them to experience. So. Yeah, that was cool to see. A lot of them got very deep into it. The lady who talked yeah. about her walking partner in the morning where they, yeah. they walk all morning long and they scream at each other the whole way <laughs> at 6 o'clock in the morning. And she said, you know, she couldn't understand why this woman voted for Donald Trump. And the woman explained, you know, I'm motivated by the economy. Yeah. And here's why I'm motivated by the economy. They were really deep into trying to understand other than saying, well, you're just stupid. Well, I d and, I dis and I disagree, and we can hopefully that they can start to pass it right, along to right. more people in their family and friends. Good job, guys. All right, and finally tonight, Mackinac Island is known for its tulips, its fudge, and its butterflies. The guys from Under the Radar Michigan go in search of butterflies here on the island. Hey, everybody, it's me again, Tom Dalton from Under the Radar on PBS TV. Let me ask you something. Are you a Lepidoptera lover? Well, if you are, there's a place right here on the island that will literally put the wind beneath your wings butterfly that is. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about the world famous Wings of Mackinac Butterfly Conservatory. It's right here on the island and it's the right place to go if you love these magical creatures. Marie Hewlett is the owner here and she helped me truly appreciate these beautiful and bountiful bugs. So am I saying it right, Lepidoptera? Mm -hmm. Very good, yes. Oh, yes. thank you, that means butterfly. Yes, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Now, what are some under-the-radar things that people may not know about butterflies, like how fast they fly and things like that? Well, they can fly like up to 30 miles an hour. A lot of people are always surprised when I say they only live three to 10 days. A butterfly does not live very long. Um, they are sadly on the bottom of the food chain, so they are meant to pollinate, to feed other insects or birds, and to lay eggs and uh, to keep that cycle going. I read they've been around since the dinosaurs. Yeah, long time. How many different varieties do you have here? I can safely say up to 40 different species, give or take. And you actually hatch butterflies here as well? We do. They come from South and Central America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And then we have pupa cases, which we hang the chrysalis, and then once they emerge, then we let them out into the conservatory. I just love looking at the faces on the kids, mm -hmm. and on Jim and, little Jimmy and Eric. <laughs> it's just, it, it is a magical place. It is, it is, yes. I love it very much. It's definitely a labor of love. 
So, if you want to have an up close and personal encounter with a bunch of beautiful butterflies, check out the Wings of Mackinac Butterfly Conservatory. It's the one time in your life you might not mind getting bugged. Well, of course, if I'm there, then all bets are off. Wow, that is just beautiful. All right, that is going to do it for us. You can see our live streaming coverage of the conference at DetroitPBS.org. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you tomorrow from Mackinac Island. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. And by... The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. Business Leaders for Michigan. ITC Holdings, LLC. Michigan Technological University. W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you 